Nine minutes. We actually all came together. Hey, Jennifer. Pardon me? We came about two minutes before you. Ah. So we were thinking about coffee. Sweet. I'll take it lightly. Well, I was. I was possible. thinking about such a on that and what I want to share. Oh, good. Um, like, I, I kind of figured out this this morning. Like, I definitely am following in Shankara's footsteps with, with what... He, there's different schools, right, that say different things, but I'm following in a Shankara sort of path. And it is very clear from what I saw again that I, I would bring up the analogy that the one is to being intellect vitality as Brahman Raguna is to Satchitananda. That, that's my analogy. That's what I see. And the watch, just yeah. show it again. Watch, watch yeah. it the show. one is to the first hypothesis is the second hypothesis as Brahman Raguna is the Brahman Saguna. The one is the being into like vitality as um, wait, what's that part? The one is to vitality. It be, it, the one yeah. is to I mean, am I gonna put it in an analogy? I mean how can you put I that which is ineffable in an I, analogy. I, I, I'm not going to object to an analogy. Yeah, well, I am putting the one in an analogy, and I'm putting Brahman Nagun in an analogy, but it's like, it can't have a relationship to anything, right? It's devoid of all characteristics, but I am doing that. And I'm saying the one is to being intellect vitality as... Well, then I guess... It would be difficult to say then that uh, the one is related to the self. Isn't that an attribute? Yeah. Yeah. So, but again, you said last night you have to remember what one you're talking about, right? The one of the second or the one of the first? Well, you can't, you can't, you can't say the one of the, I, if you're going to, I'd like to see how you can say anything positive about the one of the first. I know, that's why I was raising <laughs> Is the idea of the self included in the first hypothesis? I don't know. It is. <clears throat> Brad, how so? Ask him, not me. Well, somebody, he's just going to tell me. Somebody to get recently help. suggested that it's an analogical identity. I don't know who that was, but that. Uh, and I don't remember. Yeah, quite the I actually argument. I remember you talking about this now in one of the, the meetings. No, uh, it, was in, it was in his uh, prelude to the analogy discussion that you read. My yeah. Um, for some reason, I feel like at least so I was anyways, touched. I just wanted to throw that in as maybe a leg up. Yeah, in like your that. It's I'm not going to that. It's it. a, that it's not explicitly, but it's analogically stated. That you have to do the work to see it? Uh, well, hell yeah. Look what but he's got. Isn't that that curious? It's the end of the first person. It's the last. Uh, I read this, by the way. I'm really liking it. This is your analogy thing, right? Philosophy of analogy? No, it's Oh, it's a um, um, Let's see. You have to look at the last three paragraphs or four paragraphs of the first hypothesis. What do you find? <clears throat> is this the end of the first yes, episode? Yes, if turn the page, you'll see. I'm sorry, to, I didn't mean to hijack the conversation. No, no, no. Oh, just saying the last four or so paragraphs at the end of the first hypothesis, he discusses the idea of the self. Oh.
Uh, accordingly, then, there is neither name nor logos nor any knowledge nor perception nor opinion that can be attributed to self. What if we did allow for everybody? <clears throat> um, I, I think that, but could anything belong to that self which is not or be of self? Accordingly, then, there is neither name nor logos nor any knowledge nor perception nor opinion that can be attributed to self. Accordingly, then, neither can it be named, nor be spoken of, nor be opined of. The object of knowledge, uh, nor, nor be the object of knowledge, have a perception of self. <clears throat> okay. So it looks like that there's an equa equa equating this, equated uh, an analogical relationship be or a di identity of terms between the one and the self of the first hypothesis. Good way to begin. <clears throat> of course, now you'd have to make sure that each of the assertions he makes of the self are equivalent to what he says about the one, which we are assuming at this point. But so then, it is fair to say that he does have an assertion about the one, which is, it has the nature of the self. And, and that's it, why Aristoteles objects. He doesn't object to everything being said about the one. He doesn't think what, what follows about the self can be genuinely assertive. To me, at least... This is not me. I don't go along with that. Right. To me, at least, this certainly does not appear to be the case. This translated as... I think your notes translated as, no, the self has to be different than the one. Why did... Why, Pierre, why does he... Why does he... Uh, is the self only... In, are you saying that the it's a, it's it's shown in these last hey, four four sections or this small section? Like, why isn't this is this self in the beginning of the first hypothesis? Well, it, it, it's a it's a question of what is Parmenides hypothesis. <clears throat> It is not the one, though everybody assumes that. His hypothesis is if one self is, and whether the one is or is not. Okay, he has a combined term, one and self, as his hypothesis. <clears throat> so he explores the one first. When he finishes it, then he explores the idea of self. That is so, like, I would love to see that try to be said in some sort of, like, academic, modern context. I mean, people don't look at this, right? And they don't think like that. Like, has anyone ever talked about this before in the history of philosophy that you know For of? For Christ's sakes, my uncle did. <laughs> yeah, right. Uncle <laughs> Louie, right? My <laughs> uncle Louie did. What it, what At many say? a pub, <laughs> he was known as Harry the One. The One Self. <laughs> the, the One, one Self. self. <laughs> He'd march into the pub and they'd all lift up their drinks and say, here comes Harry with one of his diatribes. 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 <laughs> no, I, I must see, that was a camouflage. I thought you'd drop the question and it worked. <laughs> no, I'm still thinking. Oh, good, it. good. Did you want to answer now? <laughs> I didn't want to, that's why I went through the fury. <laughs> 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 I didn't want to admit in such an <laughs> august company as this that I don't give a damn about what moderns think about the Parmenides, and I never have. <laughs> yeah, no, and I, I agree. I guess, what, I guess what I'm pointing to is that, I mean, 
like Proclus or Plotinus or you know anybody that that you're asking. I told you. No, the answer was no. Did I hear that correctly? Right. Yeah. So how could something yeah. like that go like on for so long not seen? That's Brad's looker. Do you know Jeff? Jeff Stern? I do know a Jeff Stern, yes. I may have to make more. Oh. That's his persistent question. What was it? What's the question? No problem. My question is basically how could that go on for so long not seen? Yeah. <laughs> If the hypothesis is not the one, but it's really the one self. I, I, I thank goodness it's not my kind of question. I don't. Think it's yeah, I mean it is a secondary question because regardless of of how long or not how long, it's still there. So I just I find it as revolutionary almost in some sense of the word. That's okay with me. But to try to explain that, I usually dodge it and wait for Brad to come in. <clears throat> but that's, yeah, Brad could put that. That's Jeff's question always. So are there <laughs> identical terms? Pardon me, you're now going back to the one on the soul? Yeah. Um, or at least according to Parmenides. You don't know, you see. It's a very difficult question, you see, because while you can say there may be a basis for saying they are identical, uh, that's not really the case, <clears throat> unless you maintain that the two together represent his hypothesis. Mm -hmm. okay. See, to say they're identical, then people can go back and say, well, his hypothesis, therefore, is the one, since the two terms are identical. <clears throat> okay. But I prefer the other way of thinking about uh, while there are grounds for considering that, that they are identical, you have to consider that he's creating it in such a way that those two terms are linked together, one self. And that's, I got that difficult way of thinking from my great grandfather who was a friend of my uncle, yeah, Harry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, how does it change the previous dialogue when you have when you're invited to include the idea of self how does it change it? which previous dialogue or the, 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 the one you just had with Pierre about the problems of self and I mean of the one you were talking purely in terms of the one and um, um, and its identity with the other it's unity with other religions. But if you bring in the idea of self, how does that change? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I completely understand the question, actually. Well, if, 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 unless, unless you have a problem with, with bringing in the idea of the self. I, I don't, like, I... I don't, if I understand correctly, like, I don't have a problem, well, this is, I think is the issue at hand, but I don't have a problem, I think it's different than what Pierre just said, but I don't have a problem with the equating of the one and the self as identical terms, but like he said, then if you do that, then the high you have to be able to say the, the same thing about the self as, as about the one. And then you, you have to go and do that and see if that works with, with what he unfolded, right? Pierre, I think that's what you said. And then the other way of taking it is that it's actually a, <clears throat> not an equation of terms, but a term itself, one self. Mm -hmm. So that it's actually not any equivalency of two terms, an identity of two terms, but rather one term. A self-identity? A one, a one self. Are you one self and the same as like the one itself? No, I'm using it like 
as the hybrid term that he that he just mentioned oneself mm -hmm. or and I suppose it could be self one the other way as well mm -hmm. <coughs> um, I'm just wondering because I, it just came to me if you add self to the equation it kind of changes everything well, it's, you're no it, longer talking about a metaphysical one. You're talking about something that has self. Yeah, I think I'm starting to see oh, your question. That's right. That's right. <clears throat> to me, okay, look. That's right. It sounds. It, it yeah. makes it makes metaphysics personal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. It, well, I was yeah. waiting for you to say that because I didn't have the ball. <laughs> <laughs> I totally, yes, yeah, very, very important, right? It's very important. I totally agree with that. And you know, is that not, is that not Brahman and Atman? I mean, Tatvamasi. I don't know that literature that well. Tatvamasi, thou art that, right? There is, there is an identity, and, and there is no difference between the ultimate nature of reality and the self, the, the self. Okay. So that would be the one, and the self. So, now that's not a hybrid term. That's an equate. That's an a, an identity of terms. The one, the Brahman and Atman. So I think that there's another position also on the table, which would be a Brahman Atman or an Atman Brahman. Because you'd have to explain the thou. In your equation, thou art thou. Yeah, the thou is the Atman, which would be the self, uh -huh. and the Brahman is the one. Okay. And there's two positions on the table. And in the Sanskrit, the thou art that, there is an, an identity of terms. The Brahman and Atman, there's no difference. But this, I think there's another position being put out that it's a term, it's actually a term itself. It's not two terms, it's a term. The thou that. Yeah, like a thou that, or no, yeah, thou that, 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 that thou, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. So what image do you have in your mind? Tell us. You say thou is that, or thou that, or what? See, those are religious terms, right? I don't know, I don't think thou. they're religious. Thou is a I, I see term. thou as, as like, Know thyself. They don't say know yourself. They say know thyself. It's raising it to a noble level. Like you, it could be you. The difference between thou and thy is the table is on the table. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I see it as raising it to a noble level. The thou. Yeah. I don't think of a religious context. Yeah. Spiritual, of course. Yeah. Uh, but I could take the same. And now do the same for thy, as in thyself. No thou self. Noble, no no thou noble self. They're different images. Thou and thy. I don't. I, I don't. Maybe I don't. From have what that. you just said, you associate the idea of thou with a religious image of loftiness. Do you know? I don't know if it's a religious image, but it's a lofty image. Well, pardon me, I just re re reflecting on what you just previously said. Mm -hmm. I don't mind if you change it. Is, is thyself kind of like saying self, self? Yeah, see, self if they say the thou, and we want to compare it with the idea of thy, as in thyself, uh -huh. are they different images behind those two terms? I was just saying that thyself is self-reflecting on self, yeah. whereas thou is something that is apart from, is, that's the substantial in itself, but doesn't have that energy to reflect on itself. That's right. Seems like an Im right. And that's a, that's a significant difference in images can you, behind can those you two terms. That again? <clears throat> Can you say it again? I, can you say it again? I never know what. Yeah, um, we're always not, asking not, him to do that. <laughs> the, the thy, I love knowing that if you, if there's such a thing as thyself, then there's a possibility that the self can reflect upon the self. Okay. Whereas thou puts the self as a unique entity that stands by itself, pure and complete in itself, without the ability, without the act of reflecting. Sounds good. That's right, yeah.
I don't, I must have missed the class. Or thou, thou does not include the by. Yeah. yeah. Well, because to, so, it's like I an mean, emanation translate... from it, right? It's, it seems like an emanation model. Thou. Mm -hmm. Right? No. Emanated from it. Mm -hmm. And go ahead. But thy is has <clears throat> doesn't have that distance or okay. right. no. emanation or it has the emanation but it can turn back and if you want to be sure about this it's best to call on our colleague josh oh okay right you've been yes. into language right i do like words yes and i definitely like the images that come along with them yeah and thou makes it sound like an other like, it does sound religious. It does sound like thou God that out, out. See, the way your hands yeah. are? Thou God mm -hmm. that's that right. out there. You know? That's and right. When you say thine, it does, like, includes me. Like, it's, I'm in there. Like, I feel like there's some essence, mm -hmm. like, when you say thy own self. Yeah. It's got, it's already got some connection between the two, of which yeah. the otherness isn't completely other. Yeah. The otherness has already encompassed... Yeah. Or, okay. As they once said, thy is inclusive and thou is transcendent. So I have no problem then changing it to thy art that. But I was thinking the exact same thing. Right, right? that's the that's what's going on here, right? I don't I have no I have no I'm not going to defend thou. I'm more than happy to say thy art that. Well but what why not? In in con why not defend thou? Yeah. Because I don't need religious connotations. And separateness like that, like that. When I when I don't like, ever go to India. When I was thinking of, <laughs> no, there's 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 definitely aspects, <laughs> there's definitely aspects. But I, I guess the image that I have is of the thine art that, but I was using the thou art that language, and so mm -hmm. I'm more than happy to change to thine art that. Thine. Thy or thine, right? That's the same. No. Thy and thine is possessive. Thy is reflective. Okay, but I mean it's the same root, right? Mm -hmm. What I mean is the same it's the same root, right? Thy and thine? Yeah, it's the TH root right. that gives you two and, I mean, um, two in Spanish. Okay, right. So, and do in fucking Swiss German. So thine is, <laughs> thy is reflexive. Two. And right. thine two. is, <clears throat> what is, thy is reflexive and thine is, which is? No, uh, thou is transcendent and thy is reflexive. What's the relationship again between thy and thine? Thy is, well, there, there, thy can be reflexive. It reflects back on itself. Uh -huh. Thy has the secondary meaning of being a sub, a, it's like my is, thy is to my as my, thine is to mine. Okay, got it. It's okay. possessive. Okay. Thank you. But, um, but thy also has the uh, reflexive, Cheers, know sir. thyself is reflexive not it's also possessive but it's yeah i guess i shouldn't put those so far away from you here seems to be somewhat enamored here, so <laughs> <laughs> but in common i'm trying to scare by the way i don't mean to give you diabetes like <laughs> thank you no isn't isn't die in common violence just Thou is you, and thy is your. Without, if you took away the honorific, mm -hmm. you and isn't thy your? Mm -hmm. Right, I guess it would be right. <laughs> no, so your. It is possessive, but, yeah, possessive. but that's not how it functions when you say know thyself, because it asks you to reflect. Mm -hmm. it, it 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 has emotion to it. It's different from know what is fine, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but in the thigh, there's a, a divinity, I think, if I remember. There's a divine, divineness in that. See, if you're in a philosophical system that still uses religious metaphors, that's a different kind of system than a philosophical system that wants to infer whatever is being said from the, the, the most profound experiences. 
and create, therefore, a rational system under those terms. They're different. How did you describe See, that's religion? Hinduism. Hinduism has, this, we could say, they may deal with the same class of experiences, but their language is mixed with religious images, and that's what we're seeing, yeah. you see. And that's the, like we're going from the, the thou, the thou to the thy, and the images behind them, <clears throat> because that's essentially the problem with with the, the fact that they do not, the Hindus do not have a strict dialectic, as modeled such as Parmenides. They have a dialectic that models itself from Nargajuna. And, that's, and uh, that follows, of course, sexist empiricism, uh, which is, well, okay. You put, the, you put it out there a number of times. And yeah, I've okay. It. okay. I'm sorry, I'll get into it. Well, I'm keep, keep talking. <laughs> I, I, I'm following the show you. Yeah, well. Uh, I mean, do, do you see, like, is this what... I mean, there's religious aspects and spiritual aspects of all systems, right? Um, uh, no. Even, I mean, of all... <clears throat> no. Of all, um, not of all systems, but of all traditions that are talking about divinity. <clears throat> there's, there's an esoteric and an exoteric part like, you know, we get into like the Nagamati Codex versus the the, new, the the Church Council of Nicaea, what they put together is the New Testament. We've got, <clears throat> right, you've got, in Hinduism, you've got people that are praying and bowing to gods in a religious connotation and not understanding. And then you've got people like Shankara that are basically laying out the, di the dialectical process of, of going back to the whole <coughs> Brahman or the one. It's <coughs> so well, I, I see, it depends upon being careful about the use of terms at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, it is certainly true that Shankaracharya follows a rational model, but he does not employ a dialectic as we understand okay. the word dialectic that comes out of the Platonic literature. Okay. Because of their re reliance upon religious language at key points, which is just... Which is, uh, like, certainly in the Upanishads, the idea of self plays a major role. So we could ask, yes. why is it that with a major role that it plays, it does not play a parallel role as the idea of the self does in Parmenides? And the reason it doesn't is that their, their approach is they want to hold on to the religious symbolism and language, and that for them is sufficient. For Platonic, they want to say, no, no, we'll use religious language only as a metaphor. Well, that's a different kind of system. <clears throat> in, a myth, in a mythological way, right? The metaphor, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. Well, are you saying that metaphor is in one... It's always lies. It's a tool. Yes. <laughs> Whereas in, um, in religion, it's a mean. Yeah. In the Platonic literature, all metaphors are lies. Thank you. Once and again, in the religious, the all metaphors are... Essential. Lies. No, no. In, 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 Platon in the Platonic system, all metaphors are lies. Whereas in the religious system, all metaphors are... True. But by definition, a metaphor is false, right? Yeah. So we need to send them a memo. Well, 
uh, <coughs> like when when Heraclitus says uh, uh, Zeus is willing, willing and not willing, right? To be called by the name. Look at that. See what does that mean? Is they're aware of the fact that, hey, yeah, you can use the idea of Zeus one way or the other, but that's okay, but don't forget the fact that it really talks about the one. Therefore, it is not true that they hold to the idea of Zeus as a literal god functioning as a god. Nice. They're taking it metaphorically. Hey, it's true, you can say it, you can say it, maybe or not. But don't wow. fool yourself, you're really yeah, talking why, about the nature of the one. Then that's why Plato goes through such effort to develop the myths hmm. the myths he wants he wants the, the metaphorical images to coincide with that which they truly represent yeah yeah, yeah. that that understanding that seeing yeah. and that's true I reason I mentioned Heraclitus it's true for the the, the the Greek vision of language. And so then mythology is going to be the final term, right? In a three term analogy or possibly a four term analogy because it's going to be that final like what it's what's the language of Proclus of the final term? Make it makes it revert back upon the initial principle. Yeah, reverting back to the initial principle. Because it's talking about 148, right? Uh, yes. yes. Yeah, so, but what's the function of it? It reverts back and carries back to the first term, what it has received. Yeah, and so mythology, because like you could say analogy is to simile, a simile is to metaphor, and, <clears throat> right, and then metaphor is going to be analogous to mythology and the final term that reverts it back to the first term. So I'm just trying to figure out if mythology is the final term, what's the first and the second term? Oh. The dialectic has to be in there. Sure. And, but behind the, see, behind the dialectic is the idea of the logos. Right, okay, so logos, right? right? So the dialectic emerges from a logos. So the logos is primary. So <clears throat> likeness. Pardon me. The idea of likeness, if you're quoting or using the time is, is it, the most. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say it's the most beautiful bonds, but I don't know if that's what you were going for. No. Creation is what he's talking about as the the supreme principle. It's not the supreme principle of metaphysics. It's the supreme principle of creation. What likeness? Yes. So if you're talking about a discourse on the nature of creative functions, right. likeness is primary. Yeah. But that's not true, independent of referencing creation. Yeah, right, okay. In principle, all art follows the model of likeness. Because all art deals essentially with the problem of how to create from a model to a copy, and that's the principle of likeness. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that's the highest term in a metaphysics. Well, that seems clear because the, you know, we're, we're very commonly saying that the one or the good, and maybe the self, are the highest term. oneself. Yeah, right. <laughs> 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 oh, man. Hmm. What's it like, Kevin, being here <clears throat> uh, discussing these ideas with, with us as compared to um, exploring them in India? You guys are more intelligible because I agree with you more. <laughs> <laughs>
What a burden. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's a compliment or a yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, it could be a compliment. Um, I am very grateful. to have met Pierre when I was 18 and I am very grateful for all the study that's unfolded and being in India and going to these so many things it was about the Bhagavad Gita and like I bought up in Danta and been participating in these satsangs and there's a lot of people who I feel are right there with us and sometimes they use different terminology and it might sometimes make a difference and sometimes it might not I feel like I very much am in this game of comparing and contrasting I feel like that's what I've learned from at least is it all relative right like you can compare and contrast these different systems and come to an understanding of your own that allows you to follow in these footsteps and walk in these footsteps. So like, I feel very happy to be there and, and participate in all of that, even though sometimes I'm like, no, they don't get it. And <laughs> like, <so. laughs> What we'd like, see now that we know you're into this game the way you are, <clears throat> And uh, do you find that people there where you were engaged also in making these comparisons, like you mentioned the Bhagavad Gita? Uh, I think most of us would reflect upon the Iliad. Have you ever made a comparison between the Bhagavad Gita and the Iliad? I have not done that. Because you, you join those, you see. I thought that would be a great one, Brad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Brad will do it for you. That's what I was implying. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure you really like that. Right. Pass it on quick. I've learned. Never yeah, do work if you can get so out of it. You would see, right? The differences would be uh, interesting. Oh. And, and the similarities? And the similarities, sure. <laughs> there what are would that people... show? What would that show, right? Well, I mean, there are, there, there are not everybody, but there's definitely people that are into these this this comparative exploration. And they, I've known three. They find out whether they are not real quick after meeting me, because either they're going to object to the things I talk about, or they're going to participate. Well, sure. And um, sure. no, sure, not everybody was. So, as not being a Hindu mm -hmm. or a member of any of the castes, mm -hmm. how do you look upon? How would they look upon you in respect to their own Bhagavad Gita? Well, with respect to the Bhagavad Gita, I don't mean to make that obscure. If Arjuna's goal, <clears throat> what gets him into the conflict, mm -hmm. <clears throat> is that he is persuaded by Krishna mm -hmm. that if he does not enter right. into combat, right. the very system, the caste system of which they are inherently trying to preserve, mm -hmm. will fall apart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not a Hindu. They would look upon me as I, outside of the caste. I'd be caste, or I'd be a sudra. One of the hordes of the enemy. Right. Is this the outsider, or the untouchables? No. Or is that different? No, the untouchables. Yeah, the untouchables. And therefore, I'd say, let it fall apart. <laughs> but, if, but if you use that language now, uh, see, <laughs> Achilles equally didn't go to war. He did have the same problem. Right. And for nine years, he sweated out, go ahead, to hell with you. Right? So what got him into combat? Now that we know what got Arjuna 
intercom, uh, pardon me, uh, Ar yes, that's right, Arjuna intercom. Uh, one was saving the caste system, but that isn't the case for Achilles. <coughs> What was uh, Achilles? He has to discover what held him back from combat. Right. And whether or not he had grounds that are justified. And therefore he had to go through an amazing self-analysis mm -hmm. to discover the roots of his refusal to fight. Right. This that is, he had to become rational mm -hmm. on a higher level. And that therefore freed him from his reluctance to enter the warfare, he had to give up his hatred and his fury by seeing the roots of it. Hey, by seeing the roots of it. Mm -hmm. And this is where you saw the model of midwifery unfold yeah. in him. Yeah. So does the Bhagavad Gita have anything comparable to that? Actually, it seems opposite. It's opposite. irrational. Yeah. Right. It's a rat. Save the irrational system. It's saving an irrational well, system. I, that's if we take the caste system on a physical level, but, and yes, there is that unfoldment in, in society. There's a physical level, but I saw it as reality having integrity, like everything functioning properly, that, like you say, to hell with it. Like if I was an outsider, I'd say to hell with it, let it fall. That's impossible because reality has integrity and so everything's properly functioning. Like it's impossible for it not to be. Pardon me. That's using an uh, analogy to obscure the, the fact that that book specifically defends the caste system as a reality. Uh, on a physical level, you're saying. Like, and I agree, like it's weird to reconcile. Like when I'm going by on the streets and it's like there's supposed to be divine love and compassion everywhere, it's like how in the world can you reconcile that with completely yeah. ignoring yeah. a yeah. whole section of people like by saying, oh, it's their karma. Oh, yeah, well, it's a cop-out. That's right. Of course it is. So I took, I, there's that. It there's is. that. There's I mean, no that's, doubt. Yeah, but that's what Arjuna is defending. I, you know, I, 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 uh, like, I wonder if it's a metaphor, and it, it's in principle, like in other words, like there's a symbolic understanding of it versus a metaphoric understanding of it. Can you save it? I guess, yeah. I guess yeah, I'm, can night, I save it? Last night, you just, what you were telling me last night, you just defined a tragedy. A love of order is a tragedy. Love of body was a comedy and love of beauty was philosophy. And you just described a love of order, which is a tragic. And you used uh, uh, Oedipus and other social orders as, a, as an example of that. I, I, I don't want to save it for the sake of saving it. I have to go back and look. Right? I have to go back and look to see if it's analogically, symbolically presented, or if it's metaphorically, like, like trying to actually literally save the caste system. So I, 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 by the way, I didn't mean to screw up. And, and no, no, that's that's right. You're, you're exactly, I follow you if, if I think, and that's, yes. I don't want to save it as a tragedian. I want to see if it's savable as a wisdom lover. So, by saying it's a metaphor, you can find a higher way of not seeing it. I'd have to, see, I, if I can see the analogy and the similes on the symbolic level and get out of the metaphoric way of looking at it on a physical level, then I could see how it represents a higher through a lower. But I have to justify that with the text, right? See, the classic and the classic period when the caste system was in, in place before the British came, right? it was a law that a sudra, right, the untouchables, mm -hmm. any of them that even overheard a discussion of the, the Upanishads, the punishment was molten, molten lead poured into their eardrums. It's irrational. No, wait a minute. That's the law. Hey, 
equally well if a sutra was found quoting any part of the Upanishads, especially the sacred 13 or 11. The punishment was cutting their tongue out of their head. That's a religious system. That's the religious side. No That's doubt. not metaphor. That's, yeah, you know. It's not metaphysics. It's not spirituality. Well, it they, that's why, it's, it's, that's it's why they have a different, they have different roots to their system. They are a conquering people who want to impose their tyranny upon the subjected population that are the sudras. That's the model of the Gita. Does that put them in the, in the fourth then? Pardon me? Does that put them in the fourth hypothesis then? Yeah. Third and fourth, yeah, fourth and fifth. Certainly the fourth. What part of that uh, qualifies for fifth? Pardon me? What part of, of their worldview or actions qualifies them for fifth hypothesis thinking? No. Uh, those that would reject it would be in the fifth. There's always an opposition. Sure. The opposition of the fourth is the fifth, not the third. It's a step down. It's the denial of the fourth is the fifth. I thought the denial of the fourth was the eighth. That, that's equally true. Oh, so you can go either. OK, interesting. Hmm. Thank you. Well, can you just remind us of the fourth? Uh, I'm definitely not the guy to tell you, but I... I can do it. Uh, please, thank you. Right here. Okay. However, we should have to agree that the idea of the one itself stands to the pure experience described in the first hypothesis and includes the idea of the self as the most brilliant light of being or divine luminosity. The function of the self stands to the second hypothesis and the manifestation of the self is the third hypothesis when interpreters of religion's vision shift from revealed truth to duty-bound belief, they become members of the fourth hypothesis, those who are content to believe that there is no way in which anyone can know, understand, or experience the divine join the last positive hypothesis, the yes. fifth. So primarily, uh, a religion any religious community Different. that has any degree of orthodoxy is the fourth hypothesis. Right, and we and there was discussion about this there, like that people are upholding traditions with with no reason, upholding a duty bound tradition with no understanding. Well, in order like to, in system. order to preserve their their position of power. Arjuna is a kshatriya, right? right? He's a warrior. Right. And their primary duty is to maintain the privilege of the of the ruling class, which is the Brahmanas. Um, so th you're going to say there's no symbolic, analogical understanding that it's taking that metaphoric value? I'm not saying that. I'm saying if someone wants to play the game of doing it symbolically, they're going to have to remove themselves from the basic realities that it rests upon. Okay. That is, that Hinduism rests upon. Uh, yeah, because it doesn't look like they're changing this caste system anytime soon. <laughs> and how? <laughs> I mean, it's it sure as hell. You know it. You've seen it. Yeah. What's it like to, to be among them? And how they're there It's treated. hard to reconcile. It's hard to understand how someone can have this like unitary vision of the ultimate nature of reality, but like these people over here don't count. Not but, only don't count, but are not allowed yeah, in. Yeah, until they ought to participate in any way. That's right. At all. Yeah. That's right. literally kicked us in their face. That's right. It reminds me of like when you start out a dialogue to 
go towards truth. You put all of your beliefs on the table, except no. I'm kidding. <laughs> this one's on. This one you can't touch. That's my wallet. <laughs> See, that, that's why Buddhism was so central to come out of India. Right. There was this sort of reaction to that. Yeah. They said, the hell with it. Right. The hell with all those distinctions. Male and female, class systems, forget it. It has no reality in terms of the world of the spirit. The counterattack. But then, of course, in the history, the Hindus then drove the Buddhists north, and that's why they, the center of it moved from central India into Tibet and Indochina. And still they have a monastery system which yeah. is supported by the people around them to some extent. Well, maybe it's not casted. Yeah. I mean, those temples in Tibet, the pictures I've seen of them, well, yeah. they could, like, rival... European king, you know, like yeah. castles. Like, Church. that's just amazing. Mm -hmm. And you, so you have people living that still elevated lifestyle because somehow they're elevated spiritually. Yeah. So maybe it's not believed, but some functioning is still happening like that. <coughs> they still maintain that. Mm. The, the, the question is, uh, in what kind of society can Platonic philosophy flourish? Uh, I mean, it has to be and, rational. Hey, you need freedom. You need to be free of the coercive power of the state. Mm -hmm. right? Leisure. Leisure. Right. It, it, <laughs> you, can't have, you can't have a caste system. Right. That is, to, like our nation went through convulsions to get rid of slavery. That's a caste system. Mm -hmm. Still exists. We still have it. The Hindus have yet to. <laughs> the, the Hindus have class. yet to have a a, 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 a free system. It's in the of course, I wouldn't survive too long in India by urging the Sudras to arm and get into revolt. <laughs> <laughs> there he is! The yeah. government, the government, the powers that be would suck Right? Up I mean, way. even their yogis would say, get rid of the son of a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Right. I, but yet, even, see, but yet even still, right, they killed Socrates. Right. Yeah. Mm. yeah they had this flourishment, but still, that you had these, these uh, uh, people, people that to wouldn't get. tolerate it. You know. Like, no, no. See, they tolerated him, and even in the apology. Hey, two hundred people agreed with him. It was only thirty votes, thirty-one votes that that shifted it. I mean, that's amazing. That's a close call. Right. 501 are in the jury box. And, and they oh. wanted to send him away and instead of killing him as well. Yeah, yeah. But they still killed him. <laughs> <laughs> what has that got to do with it? Well, just that, <laughs> that to, the, to some extent, right, they still, I mean, they yeah, didn't but, allow it to that extent that, no, she, that he was no. killed. <laughs> they did, hey, they got rid of him. They got rid of him on the second vote when they heard his demand. Oh, right. I mean, <laughs> he killed himself. <laughs> he, <didn't. laughs> he turned around and he said, Free room and board at the Britannium <laughs> for the rest of my life. What do you think that is? <laughs> no, but but they they, they all know Socrates. Like that, I guess that's my point. Is like, yeah, they should have. They should have put. They should have gave him that. Given what he was, how who he was. I guess that's yeah. 
that they didn't, they couldn't embody him, right? Even though it is extreme and absurd and radical, but that was him, wasn't it? Like, uh, like what? What kind of a, what kind of society would say yes to that? <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> Knowing the symposium and things like that and the way in which he lived. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, it's like giving Bruno the Vatican or something. Yeah. Who? I don't know much about the guy, but like Giordano Bruno, instead of burning him at the stake, to put him in the Vatican. <laughs> not going to happen. <coughs> Why not? Uh, Why not put Socrates up there? I, in the Vatican. Well, because it's yeah. uncomfortable. It's like living Why not put Bernie Sanders in the White House? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Pierre, you know, there was that editorial response to your paper. If Pierre Grimes is right, 2,000 years of Western scholarship is wrong, right? That's right. So they wouldn't publish it, that group. And that seems to me a parallel, you know? They wouldn't. Yeah. So if they put Socrates in the Tritanium, they'd have to recognize their, their whole way of life is wrong, in one way of speaking. Yeah. That's, so yeah, it's the same, I agree. It's the same challenge to orthodoxy then? Like right. a custom, well, culturally held them. belief? Because even Socrates in the, in the Apology, the first thing he talks about is not the charges against him, and he addresses this, the stigma against him, or the beliefs that have already been passed down against him. And those are, in his words, that's what kills him, is, already, is that they've already been convinced that he's a troublemaker. So if we were to have a kind of society like that now, we'd have to have people that would be able to look at their deeply held beliefs that they held to be true and give them up. Yeah, like, it's kind of even with my dearest friends who do that with me I still feel like sometimes I'm comfortable and defensive right. and <laughs> or not consciously but is it parallel to saying how, how is it that once you have an insight into your problem you can't just let it drop the whole thing right Same it seems more. to me it's very well <clears throat> you get an insight you see that it's a pathologos that you are um, giving your life's energy to. It's sapping you. It's like a parasite. You see that, and then you go right back into playing it. <laughs> right. right. Some, and I think sometimes because you don't know an alternative. Right? And you have to be in not knowing. And, and you can't go there. I, this is just two other possibilities. I like that, though, because that not knowing takes away the structure that you're used to functioning within. Right. So in some sense, you have to still find a new way of being that has its own integrity that's not based upon tradition. And you don't know if there's one there. That's it. You're threatened. There's no role. All your relationships. That woman, Mary Marvin, who lost her relationship, she got into midwifery. She was married. She had, he was supporting her. She was an artist. She could do what she wanted. She didn't have to work. She got an insight into her relationship. Goodbye relationship. Divorce. Had her whole life changed, and she was nothing but angry at the air. She couldn't see any benefit in the insight, in the change of life, at all. Interesting. Yeah. So she was at a loss and had no ideas to come in and to support them. Like, well, <coughs> she had no idea of self or well-being or her new. Once she saw the fallacy of the old model and challenged it, she lost all the things she thought were good from that. She didn't have anything to fill it in. That's right. So she just I went think to that's like. That's right. You don't yeah. have anything. You don't have anything. I think that's right. You, even if you have a philosophical study, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not a knower in this. It just seems like your self, your self image, has to go. Well, then, what is it? What are you? And if you're not prepared to ask that question, yeah. what are you here for? And as Pierre often says. It just seems like this is where courage comes in. Right, fear of the unknown. That you have to hold on to that with courage, and not just fill it in with the first image of the self that comes along. And but to stay in that uh, for a moment at least, with courage, so that you can face the unknown. 
It seems to me like that follows from what the, the path oh, that you're on. I agree on. with you, but give me the top three people you know of that have done that. What, like... You've gotten off the cycle of birth and death? No. Um, let go of their old self-image completely. Truly ask themselves, what am I here for? Went into the unknown with courage. I mean, I'm just <coughs> listing people like Socrates and Parmenides and Pythagoras, oh, but I don't know. About, you know. Oh, people who pay rent. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, <yeah. laughs> well, I mean, this kind of goes back to being in this world, but not of this world. Like, you have an image of the self every time you pick up and drink a cup of coffee or, or get up and brush your teeth in the morning or, or put your clothing on. There's an image of the self. But if you don't identify with that image of the self, then you're, 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 you can be in this world, but not of this world, and you... Like, this is me drinking, but that's not you'll, me drinking. You'll pardon me saying it sounds like a cop. Yeah, I mean, I'm... No, that's fair enough. I think we I'm need to go... going in the direction of rudeness these days. I, I, I feel like... <laughs> it does. I, there's a self-image when I drink my coffee, there's and an so image. I just have to live in the self-image but not be of the self-image? Well, I, I guess or, my question is, how can you be in this world and still truly reflecting upon the one self? Reflecting on the one self. Or, well, I don't or, know if I should take your word seriously, but I would ask that man. Look, if I understand <laughs> correctly what you just said, let me try to restate it so that I do understand. You're saying that you drop all images of the self and you stay in that state of unknown with courage, without fear, and and go into the unknown with courage and picking up no more images of the self. Is that right? Well, I don't know. It might be enough to go on with, because I don't, I don't know if there's a dropping of all images. What I was talking about was that moment when you see that you've been living out a self-image based on a path of logos. And so you see that that's false, right, at that moment. And so can you, can you in fact, drop, drop it? And it seems to me, the second part of the problem I have with what you're saying is, courage in the Republic says going, it's a state of mind, where you have to go through pleasure, pain, desire, and fear, right? And there's a, um, there's a state of mind I'm lacking from that. So it isn't that you have no fear. It's that you can maintain um, courages to be able to Jeffrey. <laughs> Jeffrey. Go through it, right? Go, uh, yeah, well, preserve, preserve, you preserve. You have to have a faith. You have to have a, a kind of faith that the nature of reality is what the lawgiver says it is. Right. right. And the lawgiver says that you have to have no false image of the nature of reality, right? right? So you have to be able to maintain that that and go through pleasure, pain, desire, and fear, right? Right. And um, if you do that, there's a certain state of the soul that comes about, right? You become one, you become a friend to yourself. Uh, that's the, a state of virtue. But um, so, so given those two things, would I say that my question holds with respect to that? And so am I asking whether someone could do that? Is that right? And not pick up another, well, that's it, I think. One, one, one thing we've seen in our studies is that we do go from, from self-image to self-image. You go from being, being, your, being your mother to being your father to being your sister. You, you switch around roles until you see Right, all of the roles that you're playing, all the roles in succession. That is definitely what happens. But I mean, I don't know if that avoids the question of can you go to, can you stay in the state of insight and not do that? I don't know. You know, I, the, the <clears throat> I hope I'm not getting off topic, but it 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 looks like the question is that can you be in the body and not have a path of logos? Like, is it well, possible? Well, I think that's the way you saw it last time, too. Right, with the, with the cup of coffee example. But I don't think that would be the way. 
that's your take on it. I don't know why. That's an interesting take on it. I guess one thing I think about is Pierre, I remember him saying one time that the necessary condition for existing in the universe is to have a pathologos. Huh? Like, to be soul and body, the necessary condition to be in body is to have a pathologos. Like, you can't be in body without pathologos. I don't think that's right. Yeah, well, well there is you the say separation that, of soul from uh, body. I wouldn't either. put it that way, but it's similar. Uh, <clears throat> uh, to gain to gain a reincarnation is to continue with with the exploration of the self. That's all. So when you're done with that <clears throat> exploration of the self, there would be no body. Well, if you ended the highest. No, no, there, there, there would be no need for reincarnation. Right. So there'd <clears throat> be no body. But this idea of <clears throat> having an, what image must you have, or can you avoid having an image of the self when you're drinking coffee? That was one of the points, was yeah. it not? Yeah. Uh, uh, look. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Let me try it too. <laughs> I uh, say, so, what is drinking? Exactly. Exactly. So therefore, therefore there's no difficulty. Well played, well played. Being on the body, no difficulty. This just brings up another question because I was about to bring up Maharishi and the Who Am I, What Am I a moment ago. The question is whether or not the idea of the self is a, is a legitimate philosophical and only philosophical question. <clears throat> so, whatever it is that is seeing, hearing, and thinking, it's a self. So watch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll join you. Yeah. So you want to say what is seeing and hearing at this very moment? You want to say the self? Right, oh? The imageless self? Or uh, what? Ooh. ooh. <laughs> 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 image of the self. No, the imageless. Image less. Is there the image less. The image less oh, self. Oh. <laughs> like the non attribute. A bold self. Image of the self is of course, body. right. That right. So the imageless self, the unattributable self, right. Then the the ineffable self with a capital S. No, but you don't even need the <clears throat> the negative. Well, it seems to me like you're going then from first to second. But wait, wait, wait. Why? Because that's that's putting horns on a snake. I got lost. What was the question? Did you explain that? Yeah. Unnecessary. To add the Foolish to do it. What was the question? To add the negatives. How how is that like putting uh, horns on a snake? I mean, to talk about the idea of the self limitless or self without an image, selflessness, it's redundant. Right. It's, okay, so then that's like saying the, un, it's like saying the attributeless one, right? You don't need the word attributeless because the one is already attributelessness, so you're just redundant, really, redundantly speaking. I notice you put an interesting emphasis and use your hands in a very interesting way when you say one. What do you mean by that? Just then? Uh, right. right, do it again. Yeah, I'm there thinking about the one. What is that? Yeah, well, it can't be the one of the first, I guess, because I'm, it's, it's existing, it's, it's one being. Yeah. So, so but uh, yeah, so, but I'm trying to understand <clears throat> that which about nothing can be said. 
No. And its relationship to that about which the first thing can be said. It's an interesting point, you know, if you want to deal with what might fit into that category about that about which nothing can be said, <clears throat> you're engaging in a reflection and you're saying, let's see, uh, what can I put in there? Uh, <laughs> not apples, uh, not circles, not lines. But that's an invitation to speculate. And that's the name. That's not the same thing as asking, uh, "What is it that sees, or hears, or thinks?" It, it, it. One is inviting a speculation, mm -hmm. and the other is is uh, saying, "Right now, what's happening?" Those are different states. <clears throat> Would you say that the latter here is, a, is analogous to the second hypothesis? No. Go ahead. That's depending on what you mean by the second, by the way, just to make sure. Well, like one Because one when being, you, you raise the point about uh, <clears throat> a proper reflection would be, what, what is it about that of which you can say nothing? I'm saying that statement requires someone to sit back and say, let's see. Could I use the idea of space? How about nothingness? Uh, how about maybe death? It engages in reflection, doesn't it? Looking for what would satisfy that question or that point of view. I'm saying that's different than asking of, of saying, what is it that sees? Right, and I, and what I, hears what and what thinks? What I'm saying is that those questions, what is it that's seeing and hearing right now, and thinks. is the second and that the that what is it that which about nothing can be said is the first look here if, if you were in the second <laughs> uh, that's a brilliant light of being right so well, and, and when you say so the self is yeah, yeah, seeing and hearing so the, <clears throat> you want to say that answers the question of what sees, hears, and thinks? Well, if you recognize <clears throat> the self, as you said, in that, because you just clearly said a moment ago, the self is the answer to that which is seeing and hearing. And if, if, if in that, that's, that's got to be connected I mean, to that the most either, light of being. That is either true or it is not true. <clears throat> that inquires a reflection a looking, an inquiry. That's an active meditation on every moment, every microsecond in your existence. And it has its fun aspect. I don't know. What's at stake? Like that statement is Parmenides' teacher. That's Xenophanes. So Parmenides took that and said, oneself, yep, let's talk about it rationally and see what follows. It's amazing. Truly amazing. And I have proof of that. I can call on Brad. Well, that's nice. That's the, that <laughs> fits, right? With Xenophanes yeah. thinking. Yeah. That's his statement.
<laughs> and people that followed him said, oh, what he means is that it's the mind that does all that. But that's, a, that's, that's not what he said. But I liked what he said. Which is simply, it's the whole. Other people stick in God, depending upon what translation you get. I remember, is it, is it, is, is unified implicit in that whole? No, no. So then it's not, so then it's a whole part relationship? No. Then? No, there are holes that are, that have nothing to do with parts. What? I, I don't know if I'm getting off the topic, but I just... Well, no, 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 that's a very important point. Uh, it is not true that for every whole, it, there must always be parts. Can you give me an example, please? What? Of a whole that has no parts? Yes. Right now? Yes. In the next five seconds? That's right. And that easily can be shown to be true for beauty itself. It's a whole that doesn't have distinguishable parts. Then how do you, what do you make the distinction between whole and oneness? Well, that's easy. Uh, oneness presupposes, one. I think you mean one rather yeah, than oneness. Right, right, right. Because right. of the ness, exactly. Yeah, that's easy. A whole always always assumes something that has existence. The one is not, cannot be asserted to have an existence. That is to say, okay. if someone walks into, in, into our group and says, man, I just had the most brilliant light of being experienced, someone would say, <clears throat> whole? Yeah. Parts? Do, can you break it up into parts? No. Oh. But by the way, would you agree it truly exists? Yeah. Well, there must be a cause for existence? Yeah. Therefore, behind <coughs> the experience of beauty itself must be that which is beyond beauty itself, and it's called the One. So there is a class of things called whole, which do not have parts. Then it sounds Also, like the idea of truth. It looks like that then you're, that there's an identity of terms between whole and one now. Pardon? It looks like it, it. Is that not asserting that there is an identity of terms between whole and one? No. Because every whole is a one? No, because a whole, again, the idea of whole presupposes existence. Okay. The assertion of existence presupposes something that brought it into existence. So like beauty, <clears throat> justice, temperance, wisdom are going to be holes. Yes. And but being into like vitality are going to be holes. But how do you reconcile that with that they're, in, they're impartable essence and that they're aspects? Pardon me, if you said impartable, then you agree that it is a whole without having parts. Right. But that, that, well, that's where <laughs> I, I mean, use the word oneness. You're agreeing. That's where I, so a wholeness. So you gotta change your word oneness to wholeness. Well, I think I gotta change whole to wholeness. I don't mind you changing that. And then, uh, -uh yeah. By the way, if you do the use the idea of wholeness, you must agree it presupposes the idea of whole. Right. Yeah, okay. this presupposes the one but so but what I understood is like okay so let, let's and I think of Proclus for a moment like and the preservance the protection the perfection the what is it Brad the preservance five P's, and, the, five P's and, and what's the C uh, what is it protection? conversion yeah is that right so protection, preservance, perfection, purification, conversion, That's and it. I'm missing one. 
There's a four piece. Five four piece in a C. Yeah. So those are said to be. I. That you can. There's language that. So yeah, impartable. I don't know, man. I want to say that uh, there's something. Yeah, there's something. So we're going to say the one is the oneness as whole is the wholeness. And oneness is not the one and wholeness is not the whole. And the, the, the P's and the C are like the oneness. And it sounds like we're also saying it's like the wholeness. And then that's where the terms are collapsing for me. The one and the whole. Pardon, that's not clear with that last step. What is not clear? <clears throat> is there a difference between the one and the whole? No. Like, yeah, you said this already, right? No. The whole presupposes existence. I got it. <clears throat> so, but it's still, it's interesting. If you hold to the analogy you created, there cannot be an identity between those two sets of terms. Right. So then, Since what binds those two is the idea of similarity, not identity. Formally. Yeah. If similarity, right? Likeness. Similarity is not likeness, but I don't mind that. Well, it, it's... Similarity is... is it's a relationship between two kinds of sets. Right, and that's where the likeness appears. No, it doesn't. That's so, where similarity appears. Okay, hold on. I remember listening to you the other day, and it was clear that you have sets of terms, like the one is to oneness, okay? And there's no likeness, right, yet? And you have the whole wholeness, and there's still no likeness yet, but it's only likeness when you put the sets together. And the Only one yet. is to oneness as the whole is to wholeness. What, what, what did I miss? And, you know, the, like, where does likeness arise? I, likeness is a relationship between alternative terms. Okay, the alternative terms. Within a four term or uh, under special conditions, a so three term. So the one is like the whole, <clears> just <throat> as oneness is like wholeness. Right, that's the alternative term, right? A is to C, B is to T, alternative terms. I thought that's what I said originally. No, but that's okay. A is to B I'm as C is to D. The one is the oneness as whole is the wholeness. Huh. And where is likeness again? This is very important to me because likeness is... The one is like whole. Right. That's the alternative term, right? A is the C is B is the D. Yeah. Right, okay. Just, I'm clear. Okay. Now you may choose not to put them in terms of analogy to make your point. <clears throat> but if you want to use an analogical structure, then certain things follow. <clears throat> I mean, it is. <clears throat> I don't know if this is even. I don't know if I'm changing the subject, but it's like this leads me to the statement that you know we participate in a hierarchically structured nature of reality, and it's only through analogy that we can work our way back to the source or the highest term analogically reverting of course and, and can, sure would you, would you say the one is able to be put in an analogy of course put it in an analogy also can put the oneself in an analogy <clears throat> but it's then not going to be 
that it's not going to then be the one of well if it has a relation it, it must have an attribute right I don't suppose you could say what is the, in, the analogy of the one self so again. that we could hear it and then argue it <laughs> yeah what is the analogy of the one self yeah man <laughs> me. <laughs> this is what I look at Brad. I will buy you a Four. beer for that one. Four. I the analogy of the one self. Well, okay. So one self is to Why aren't you one being. Why? Oh God! Finish it. Finish it. As. <clears throat> soul is the soul and body. Okay. Right. That would be I, I, could, I think I can go with that. The one is, the one, one self is to one being as world soul is to, I mean, as the world soul being demi Virgos. I don't know what. World soul. Well, remember, this goes, this goes, ah, uh, gosh, I know, I'm, I'm just, it reminds me of that tree terminology from uh, Plotinus, right? The one is to be intelligible as the intelligible is the soul, and then the second tree terminology, the intelligible is the soul, as the soul is the soul of the body. I don't know, Pierre. I'm not trying to give you diabetes. I don't know where we're going. I lost all sight of what we're, of what we're trying to get at the root of. Although I love all the language that's unfolding. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> and I am eternally grateful. Oh. Can I can I ask a uh, of our entire morning's discussion? I have to say this has been wonderful for me, but I would like to be able to sum it up the last two hours and say, and if we're leaving something open, that's fine. But of the things we've discussed, what is the most important thing that is still on the table? What's the core issue? Yes, exactly. Good. One self? What? I'd say the whole. <coughs> There's that, definitely, and there's the one self of the of the first. I think that's kind of how it all started to this morning. At least that was one thing that started it this morning. Was so, is was the question about identity between one and self or or or, or is it actually one self? Not one self, but one self, self one, yeah. versus an identity of terms between the self and the one, or the one and the self. <coughs> and then looking at the last part of the first hypothesis, I don't know actually. What, what would you say? Is the one issue or, or summing it up? What's the one question that is on the table or that? Well, yeah, issue? that's. I mean, you know, I have a, I have a habit, as it's been pointed out to me, of dragging on beautiful discussions right at the time when Pierre's got to go. <laughs> so I won't do that. But if there's a, um, if there's a, if, uh, it sounds like there's a couple of really great questions here. But if there's, if we could put it all into one koan that we can walk out the door with and chew on for the rest of the day, or <clears> what would that be? We collapsed in trying to figure out what is the highest analogy possible, metaphysically speaking, 
basing itself ideally upon the Parmenides or some other religious system. <clears throat> so what is the highest analogy? If the analogies can be hierarchically arranged, we're struggling for what would be the highest of all of those possible analogies. Um, that's where our colleague was going through turmoil in his soul as he was trying to figure it out one way or the other. Welcome and, to turmoil. And Brad was sitting in the background chuckling, which is why he had to get up there on the doorway and laugh. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I'll take that. What is the highest analogy? Metaphysically, not only in relationship to the Parmenides, but then also anywhere else. Bhagavad Gita, Upanishads. Well, you're not going to get much from the Bhagavad Gita. No, but Upanishads. Uh, possibly. Rig Veda. Possibly. Yeah. And Shankara, because that, I mean, that's, but he's explicating what he sees in the Upanishads. Hmm. I want to unpacking it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I bring it around sometime. I looked at it this morning. You, you know, you're the one that no, told no. me to get it when I went to India. You're like, no, make no, sure no, you no. take Shankara's Upanishad okay. commentary. Let's read it. Come on. Well, I mean, no, okay. Well, pardon me. Yeah, that means you have to recall what you just said. I I, I looked this morning again. No, no, no. What was it you just said about Shankaracharya? that he was unpacking what he saw in the Upanishads and then after that I said that um, Beth, if you change your language I don't mind it a bit you believe that sh that Shankaracharya has explored or unpacked as you said the idea of the soul I at that moment said oh my god you must have some interesting passage in mind because due to my failing memory, I don't recall it. So I would be very happy to rehear it and re reassert that great principle by a good quote that we can all share from your reading. And uh, we're we're now talking again about the, the the self and the one. I don't care how you express it. You said you would have. A quote that shows God upon God upon Shankaracharya is unpacking the idea of the self. I said, "Good heavens! I must have missed it." Could you please read that where he unpacks the idea of the self in the Upanishads? Well, I I think I've got it, but I I yeah, just go, gonna, just read it. Well, you're gonna. I don't want to keep you. Oh, don't don't don't. don't. And it, you know, at this point, I think I would just like to hold it for a moment because I want to mm. go back and look at it and be very clear before I open my mouth. Don't worry about making a mistake. Yeah. We'll all laugh. Yeah. <laughs> That's what <laughs> friends are for. Right? That's okay. <laughs> right. So what? Right. Okay, how about this one? Um, well, the, the, this is actually just from the Upanishads. So I need something that's Shankara's vision. The Upanishads definitely unpack the, the idea of the self. Just go ahead and just read it. Okay, well, I don't even know what this does, but this is one quote. You cannot see that which is the seer of seeing. You cannot hear that which is the hearer of hearing. You cannot think of that which is the thinker of thought. You cannot know that which is the knower of knowledge. This is your self with a capital S that is within all, everything else, but this is perishable. Did That's... That, did that unpack the idea of the self? Okay, so 
like a dialectic on the self. That's what I'm what, looking whatever, for. Whatever, see, it's your language. I don't want to impute my understanding. Well, I, I would say that that's what I'm looking for, is a dialect on the self. Yeah, would you call that a dialectic No, that wasn't on the a self? dialectic on the self. Like, I, I want to see it just like Parmenides with the hypotheses unfolding dialectically with the self as the starting term. See, look here. <clears throat> Parmenides explores the idea of the self in terms of the idea of, of uh, purely and then connected with the idea of usia. Right. He does that through the first three propositions or the three first hypotheses. Would you say well, that's what you just read? No, I would say that what I just read is a statement that would be appropriate for a hypothesis. Like with it, it would, like it would only fit within a particular hypothesis. And therefore, it doesn't unpack Pack it, it right. in respect to the, what we just talked about. Um, no, hmm. uh, it doesn't unpack it. There's another quote. Um, because I was looking at um, I doubt I'm going to find, though, a dialectical treatment of the self the way that I would in the Parmenides. Yeah. And, you know, in Proclus, he did the soul, right? He did the dialectic on the soul. Uh, is it, I can never remember where this is. Is it in the uh, commentary. commentary of the Parmenides? Is it in the Parmenides commentary? Right. Does Providence? Yeah. It's also in the elements of theology. Uh, I thought of, for it's some reason I want to say in the, the on, Euclid's on the first book, I want <clears throat> I, for some reason I want to say it's in Euclid's, the, the commentary on Euclid, uh, the first book of Euclid, but anyways, if I can find it, I will, but it's like, I'm looking for something like that, and I don't necessarily think I'm going to find it formally, so what does that mean, like, the distinction of formally, well, can I see it informally? Like he's I don't not know what making it ex yeah, explicit, I, I, but it's implicit. Well, there's a lot of things. You're lucky if you use the idea of searching for that which is implicit. <laughs> the question is whether or not you can attribute to something that is, in some way, render it explicit, not implicit. Sooner or later, we got to say, hey behind all of these implicit meanings, there must be something explicit from which all of these must be generated, have to connect it in some way. Um, yeah. <sighs> so then, wh what do you see as the relationship between Shankara's treatment of the Upanishads and his commentary, and like Proclus with the Parmenides. <laughs> I don't know. You're the one that told me to get this stinking book on my way to India. You know, you're like, oh, you gotta have the commentary from Shankari. You know, for the Upanishads, and like I'm reading it, and it's like completely analogous to the Parmenides to me. And now it's like I'm starting to figure this out, you know, like what's no, no, let's see. And I'm by the way, I'm just joking when I say you told me to get it, but it's like but listen, I need that needs an explanation. Since I knew you were going to India and dealing with the Hindu philosophers, 
I mentioned that their key thinker happens to be two people, Gaudapada and Shankaracharya, and it was very important for you to get, if possible, the Nikola Landa translation that contains it in the four volumes. Which is what I did. Yeah. This is what I'm looking at right now. Yeah. And, and what I'm seeing is that it's analogous to the Parmenides. Uh, look here, I don't doubt that you see that. <laughs> but, but someone may ask you, can you show Would me you that? mind showing that yeah. in respect to the Parmenides? <laughs> yeah. I suspect at this point you might have a wish but not yet fulfilled it. I haven't prepared the formal yeah, yeah. lecture. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you will. <laughs> yes. By mastering the Parmenides. And, and the, the other shots. Yeah, yeah. And, and Shankara <laughs> and Proclus. Yeah. See you tomorrow. Yeah, well, we'll look <laughs> forward. <laughs> okay, here comes the right? movie, dude. Tomorrow seven. <laughs> yeah. There, there is a meeting of Parmenides tomorrow. Um, yes. And you're invited. Yes, I'll be there. All right. <laughs> Very beautiful. Thank you, sir. Here. Pleasure. <laughs> He's got to get out the door, though. we got to let this man go. Uh, where did you get this idea that there's a hole with no parts, since the very first <laughs> hypothesis says that a hole is that which has parts, and therefore it is not one, the one. Of course. Oneself. So what? What's that got to do with the issue? And so where's, so, how do you, where's the, isn't that the definition of a hole, is that which has parts? That is one definition of an idea of a hole. Yes, there's nothing wrong with it. I often use it. Right. So why would you use a hole that which has no parts? I wouldn't just you, did. Wouldn't you call it one or oneness? Or? Pardon me, there's a difference between one and oneness. Which one do you want? Okay, oneness. Or, I mean, why would you even say it was a hole? Wouldn't you say it was oneness? Because you, then you would say that therefore it's no, it has no parts. This is exactly, I feel uh, like. See, yeah. uh, the question you're raising is, is uh, <clears throat> there may be some, some holes without parts uh, that uh, may not be attributed to the idea of the one. Apart from that, uh, th th that misses the point. The point is, what do you mean by parts when you're talking about a whole? Does it not mean you can make distinctions such that the particular distinctions you make represent each of the parts? And that in any whole that has a series of parts, each of the parts therefore relates both to itself and to one another? Yeah, I thought that was the definition of the whole. Yeah. By the way, have you ever heard this idea that there's such a thing as brilliant light of being? I've heard. Does it have parts, distinguishable, separate from one another, that can be related to one another? Uh. As parts, go ahead. That there was uh, Osea. There's. Uh, is, pardon me, is that a part? Yeah, I would say it aspect. Would, it would be just, it's a distinction which could be described as a part. How can it be described as a part if a part presupposes making a distinction which can be related to other distinctions as particular parts that nonetheless have relationships among themselves? If I say there's such a thing as color and someone were to say to me, is it a oneness or does it have, a, is that a kind of a thing that has a whole that parts? I'd say quickly it has parts and if they were to ask me, what are the parts? I'd mention all the different kinds of names they give to the colors. Each one is distinctive. Each one can be related to the other. And therefore, it satisfies the idea that a whole has parts that are distinguishable. Now, would you say the experience of brilliant light of being 
has equally similar distinctive parts separate from one another yet can be related as colors stand to one another? Uh, when you talk about the ex you talk about the experience, yes, I think you can make distinctions. Well, go ahead, make them just as I did with well, all of the colors. Brilliant. Are those parts separate? Now that's going to be separate. Well, I, I, there, I, I thought there was a, a difference between the colors and the parts. Okay. Things that were separate and those that distinguish. That is that. The They're going to be different. Separate and is going to be separate from distinguish. Good. I'm with you, Regina. Uh, no. Uh, well. Like aspects, like yes, you can say it's brilliant. It's you're comparing it with other, other. You're saying it's most brilliant. Um, things like those would be aspects. Pardon me, we're talking about parts now, not aspects. Well, look, take another example. Would you agree there's such a thing as space? Would you say it has distinguishable parts? Distinguishable parts? Space? Mm, no. Thank you. Then there is something that is a whole that does not have parts. Would you agree we can talk about time? And within time we can make distinctions, can we not? Yes. And each is separate and distinguishable? Defining parts as separate, then I'd say no. What do you mean? You don't think the past is separable from the present? Of course, you can make distinctions that are separable within a whole. There are different kinds of holes, therefore. Okay. There's the idea of space, there's the idea of time. How about the idea of eternity? Does it have parts and holes? What would be the parts of eternity? What would be the parts of eternity? Well, it wouldn't be a whole. <laughs> you mean, isn't it a whole? Don't you mean, it's, by whole, would you not agree there are ideas? Well, and we can ask whether or not this idea or that idea is past, present, and future taken together as a simultaneous well, whole. about the Parmenides, when he talks about it in the first, the second hypothesis, he breaks it down into one and being, or one and usia, or one participates in usia. So he doesn't use the word, and he does say that there is a whole that has a part. I mean, what model could we use then if that, well, I'm assuming that's the highest model. So there is, there's another, okay. I'm assuming that's the highest model, I guess, to distinguish where you define terms. So maybe, uh, so a whole is that which has at least one part. Pardon me, it cannot be a whole with only one part. That doesn't make any sense. Well, that's what it says. Pardon me. <laughs> the, the definition as a whole of what you just said shortly is that it's the sum of its parts, that's plural. Can you have a whole with only one part? I didn't say it was the sum of its parts. Okay, the sum of its parts? I No, I didn't say that. I said that in the second hypothesis he talks about Pardon me, whole. the issue is not the second hypothesis. The issue is whether or not you can talk about a whole independent of parts. That's the subject we're on. A whole, talk about a whole independent of parts? I think you can describe something as a whole, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't have parts, or that, it can't be distinguishable me. That parts. is why I asked the question whether or not it is possible to talk about space as a whole. 
Is it a whole? Sure, I can say Does that. it have distinguishable parts? I think you I mean, get into seeing, if you got into it, yeah, you could probably well, get into Well, do get into it, tell me. Then you can't get into it to tell me the parts, though. I don't, I can. But you do believe it has parts. If it's a, if you describe it as a whole, I'm assuming, yes, it would have distinguishable parts. Well, then tell me about the distinguishable parts. I don't know. Then you're holding to the idea that there's a whole of which you cannot distinguish parts. Oh, I see, sure. Uh, I would go back then to um, the most brilliant light of being, which is already saying that it's most and brilliant and light. Are those the question is whether or not those are parts. Do you understand? Not, not if they're not in the physical sense of separate. Well, then, then you if you don't mean it in that sense, what possible way do you mean it to preserve your idea? That they are distinguished, distinguishable aspects to what you call the whole. But not separable. But not cut up in pieces or separate. Did you hear what my colleague said? Are they separable? Are the parts separable? As the ones you just mentioned? No, I would say they are not separable. Well, therefore, it's, yet, hey, therefore it's not a part. Parts are separable. Oh, well, then that's a definition of okay. part that I thought was not part of the second. I thought there was a distinction. Unless it's, it's, a, it's a language issue. So, I, then I don't understand the argument of the second hypothesis, which breaks think, out one being yes. as yes. having that there is a whole and part, but each has that which is the other. Look here. So, it's interesting. It's Whether or not. <clears throat> you can find it in the second hypothesis or not, uh -huh. there is still the question of whether or not, philosophically speaking, there can be a whole without distinguishable parts. That's the point we're on. I have no idea. <laughs> well, pardon me, you just agreed that you can talk about some things that are whole that do not have distinguishable parts. That I know of that doesn't. Pardon me, didn't you use the idea of space? Did we not talk about so the idea of each one? Okay. That I know okay, which you don't want to. Well, I'm, okay, say, I'm, I don't know the distinguishable parts of space. Or beauty. See, you're a position, Regina, of saying, <clears throat> While I do not know whether these things have parts, I still think, and I want to hold to the notion, that a whole can only mean that of which it has parts, either the sum of or the totality of parts. Right? <clears throat> okay, that's a position. I didn't say sum of. I didn't say that's not my language. That's not me. I didn't say sum of. I'm, I am concluding from what has just been going on. Whether you own it or not, that's the way the reasoning has developed. Well, is, is the reasoning go to the sum of that if it has parts, that the whole is the sum of its parts? Um, I, that's not my reasoning, but if, it, if it's distinguishable, maybe that is. I, I don't know. It just strikes me that in the first hypothesis and the second, hypothesis, he's defining part, whole and part. And this is, and to say that the whole has, it's a relationship with the whole. If you have a whole, then why doesn't it assume some kind of part? And you're saying, no, it doesn't. No, no. Did you see that you had difficulty assigning parts to certain ideas that you hadn't thought of as a whole? <clears throat> and could not come up with the distinguishable parts. Is that where the discussion I say I, Because I can't, 
know, in the space idea, I, I, I mean, that's not something I... Space, okay. Uh, what's space? Just a couple days. It's empty. It has no distinctions, I guess. Therefore, it has no parts. But then I wouldn't call it whole. It wouldn't be proper to call it whole. But isn't that idea a totality of something? If it's a totality, it well, isn't a totality a whole? Totality of what, though? It, it can't be a totality if it has if it's a whole. You mean it doesn't exist? You mean objects don't oc don't occupy a space? You mean there's no such thing as a place or a space? Okay. All right. I, I'm just puzzled. I just find Thank it you, interesting. Beer. Okay. Good. Okay. Pleasure. It's a new idea. Thank you, it's new. I'm on the hunt for something, and so I want to Here's talk when I get at least a sniff of it, okay? Is that, good? Is that good? I said I'm on the hunt of something, a problem, and I, I can, I'm, it's very interesting. It would be good. Now. Now?